Hello everyone! Being a miserable bastard, when I heard there was a new map coming to DCS that was free, I thought there had to be a catch. I mean, who gives away free things? Well, I can kind of answer that. A few years ago, Mrs. Lowby responded to an ad giving away a clock. When it came time to collect it, I was press ganged into service with platitudes of, Oh, what if it's a weirdo? Of course it's a weirdo, my love, they're giving away free shit. As long as it's not a rapey or murdery weirdo, you'll be fine. And if they are, I really don't see why I should have to share your fate. I was much more naive back then and fell for the whole, oh, you said some magic words in front of a registrar horse shit. Along I went protesting, and as predicted, there was a huge catch. We had to listen to this old bint rattle on about how our children and grandchildren were horrible, how her husband ran off when the kids were young, to which I inquired if she had ever made him accompany her somewhere against his better judgement, the only response being a withering glance from Mrs. Lau B. At that point, I phased out, wishing I had brought along some Dignitas brochures, while sincerely but fruitlessly hoping Mrs. Lau B had learned her free things lesson. So, to answer the question, who gives away free things? Lonely fucking weirdos, apparently. So, now that you've been warned, welcome to my first look at the Marianas Islands map for DCS. Now we're going to delve a little into the history of the islands as a whole. History begins here in 1521 when the Spanish arrived during the Global Circumnavigation Voyage, which was commanded by Ferdinand Magellan. That's not to say there wasn't a lot going on before, it's just we know fuck all of what that was. The islands were originally settled by tribes in around 1500 BCE. There were several influxes from elsewhere over the millennia since, bringing rice farming which was unique to prehistoric Pacific Island cultures. The Spanish arrived more than likely here at the bay north of Cocos Island looking for food and water. The Spanish at the time, and for a couple of subsequent centuries, believed that anything they laid eyes upon that wasn't already host to English, French, and later Dutch cannons pointed at them was pretty much theirs, including its resources and people, who were classified as savages due to the fact that the god of the Spanish was too lazy to get off his hole and go have a chat with the Pacific Islanders. Native Americans, Filipinos, Chinese, Japanese, you get the picture. The trouble first arose because tribal cultures often have a communal sense of ownership, which is antithetical to modern and pre-modern societies. So the Spanish arrived and said Gib, expecting to receive. The islanders swarmed onto the Spanish ship and treated themselves to multiple five-finger discounts, including a fucking rowing boat to take it all away. For a modern equivalent, imagine a truck full of TVs breaking down outside a campsite, and the driver naively going through the gates to seek help. For that matter, imagine anyone breaking down outside a fucking campsite. The Spanish were of course pissed, and in perhaps one of their more restrained First Contact episodes, went ashore, killed a few tribes people and took all their shit back. The Spanish then referred to the islands as Ilas de los Ladrones, the islands of thieves. Over a century later, the Spanish claimed the islands and named them after the Austrian Queen Regent of Spain, Mariana. She was a Habsburg. The Habsburgs were literally the kings and queens of incest, in every meaning of the phrase. If the Habsburgs had invented Tinder, the tagline would be, find romance in your sister's panties. And the desired attributes would be hemophilia, deformity and insanity. To the islands, the Spanish brought the usual European fare of slave labour, stabbings and venereal disease. And within a century, approximately 96% of the original native population of 50,000 had died out. Things continued like this for over a couple of centuries until Spain lost Guam to the US in the Spanish-American War of 1898. In 1899, the Spanish, who were at this point totally destitute, sold the remaining Marianas Island to the Germans for around $4 million. To modern eyes, it seems fucking hat stand to sell a place including its inhabitants, but soon things would get even stranger. Before I get into that, it would be remiss of me not to provide a broad brush background on the forces at work at the time. I should also point out, as it will very soon become apparent, that I'm not a historian. But I'm not a gynaecologist either, and that's never prevented me from rolling my sleeves up and diving in. There was a new kid on the East Asian bloc. Since the visit by Commodore Matthew Perry on behalf of the US in 1853, when Japan was forced to open to world trade at gunpoint, Japan had quickly evolved into a modern regional power with western-scale colonial ambitions. Nationalism and imperialism were a global malaise at the time, 
However, Japan had a unique susceptibility for these, due to a combination of an intense loss of face at the hands of the Americans, coupled with the belief in their inalienable right to be masters of Asia as a result of the rapid transition from exceptionalism and feudalism to exceptionalism, militarism and mercantilism, which were then blended with current theories of racial hierarchy. Japan had the briefest of dalliances with pseudo-democracy in the 10s and 20s. I say pseudo because the army and navy possessed the right to veto cabinet appointments. Any chances for democracy to take root were pretty much killed off in the 30s by the global recession. At this point in Japan vying for power were two military factions, the Toseha and Kodoha, whom quite frankly were similarly lined groups of fucking lunatics with totalitarianism central to their methods of achievement. They only differed on their degrees of spirituality, mechanization and their respective strategies for a war of expansion. The Toseha faction which argued for total industrial war won the argument. The Kodoha were purged, the Toseha then disbanded, many of their members joining other radical nationalist and sometimes religious factions, all totalitarian who became part of the Imperial Rule Assistance Association. Now maybe it's just me, but isn't there something very arrogant about that name? It implies the Emperor needs assistance to rule. He's supposed to be a fucking god, surely he can take care of shit without assistance. To provide a glimpse of how fucking maniacal these idiots were, terms like holy war were often used officially. Just as a quick sidebar here, psychopathic groups of slobbering nationalist maniacs in Japan have a fucking preternatural knack for coming up with sweet innocent sounding names, like the Cherry Blossom Society, Japan Youth Society, Great Enterprise Society and Black Ocean Society. I can almost hear a journalist back then getting a quick pre-election soundbite. So Nomura-san, what are your defining policies? First we kill the gaijin, then reipu. Thank you, Nomura-san, from the Hugs, Kittens and Fluffy Cloud Society. The Japanese journey to modernity was propped up by the revitalization of the centuries-ignored imperial family, with the emperor as a living god glued to the top of the Shinto totem pole. Shintoism itself was remolded into a modern state religion, a status it has retained despite what successive governments say. Prior to the Meiji and Taisho eras, late 19th and early 20th century respectively, Shinto was an umbrella term for very diverse sets of beliefs. With the opening of Japan, it was fused with Confucianism and the more nihilistic elements of Buddhism. Confucianism itself, which is very strong on personal responsibilities but completely fucking wanton on personal rights, was throughout history used and continues to be used as the moralistic background of many a shitty dictatorship, and even a couple of great modern shitty dictatorships. Zen Buddhism, itself a Japanized version of Chan Buddhism, putrefied in a sequestered Japan, thus magnifying its nihilistic tendencies. Shame, while not unique to Shintoism, was a powerful social weapon, whereas Abrahamic religions used shame to stifle the adventures one may embark upon with one's cock, with predictably destructive and disastrous results. Shintoism in the modern sense used shame to amplify responsibilities while simultaneously disposing of personal rights and freedoms. Every military strives to achieve conformity and uniformity. In societies where individual freedoms are sacrosanct, a soldier is encouraged to volunteer service through inducements or a sense of patriotism, itself not immune to cynical manipulation. Training and the application of shame or punishment is applied to make the soldier responsible to and for his comrades. Ask combat veterans and most will tell you their immediate concern was for the lives of their colleagues, followed by the achievement of their task and their eventual return to their families. Furthermore, on an entirely objective basis, in the modern professional army the basic unit in the person of the infantryman has value. The cost of his training, plus his knowledge and experience, all carry a value that sometimes take a small fortune and years to replace. The combination of a meshing of a new orthodox version of Shintoism, the Godhead and the Emperor, and pre-existing wanky views of honour created a system in Japan whereby even an otherwise insignificant failure wrought deep personal shame. It was akin to lining up your parents, grandparents, ancestors and the royal family with the Emperor at the end of the line and cock-slapping them one by one on each cheek. The person had almost zero objective value. With their combined objective and subjective values to family, friends, colleagues, etc. sitting on the opposite end of the scales to the ubiquitously dangerous presence of shame. In the very literal sense, it was do or die. Throughout history, militaries have conducted suicide missions. However, since the post-World War I era, these have only been undertaken where either survival, the outcome of a battle, or some other vital advantage has provided justification, or at least the cover of justification. 
In most militaries subsequent to World War I, officers and soldiers have often had to specifically volunteer for such missions knowing their chances were slim. For the Japanese, every incident, skirmish and battle carried the weight of a suicide mission that their Axis and Allied counterparts would deem unthinkable. For the average Japanese soldier, if a battle or skirmish was obviously lost, the only refuge was personal annihilation, either at the hand of the enemy or by one's own. Neither a squad nor an individual soldier could yield, even in a successful battle where it was obvious that being taken prisoner was only going to be a temporary affair, surrender was the deepest of many shames. Japanese mothers would give their departing teenage sons tantos with exhortations to use them to kill themselves rather than surrender, which would shame their loving mothers, fathers, ancestors, and Hirohito forbid, the emperor himself. Of course, up to this point in the video, the elephant in the room, the pearl necklace, the spunk dangling precariously from the secretary's glasses, has been Bushido. This not-so-ancient-as-one-would-think code was largely formalized in the late 19th century, when thanks to modern agriculture and mechanized means of production, like-minded, misty-eyed, moronic, romantic fucktards popped up all over the globe like genital warts. Fucktards whom relieved of many previous daily existential pressures had more time on their hands to revile the modern world and lament an idealized long-dead past that never truly existed. It's basically the philosophical version of the girl you nearly got to fuck. She becomes more beautiful with each passing year. The difference is with pseudo-historic national mysticism, that girl never fucking existed. Sorry weeaboos, but a large proportion of it is bullshito, in just the same way incurable gobshite sprang up in the West, whom upon realizing that we're all the progeny of tribalistic savages, attempted to tout Spartan values or romanticized chivalric commandments. When romanticized national mysticism infects modern mechanized militaries and is fertilized with the watery arse gravy of exceptionalism, the vines of criminality grow thick and strong. It's also very important that I briefly mention that by the 1930s, Japanese soldiers and officers were conditioned from day one to thoroughly dehumanize those that fell under their power. Officers would beat junior officers, NCOs would brutalize soldiers. Even though they wore the same uniform, Japanese-born soldiers would brutalize Okinawan, Korean and Taiwanese colonial soldiers, who would in turn amplify the treatment to the unlucky prisoners that fell under their control. Soldiers often underwent their bayonet training on live prisoners. There was pressure from above to torture and murder prisoners of war. From the top down, it was a war crime machine. I'm open, as in everything else, to being wrong, but my belief is the aforementioned socio-religious characteristics were combined and cynically nurtured to leave no other avenue for the Japanese soldier but destruction. The central repugnant reasoning being, how can you surrender to them after what we did to their comrades? They'll do even worse to you. A collectivized responsibility that guaranteed fanatical obedience. With the surrender already held in disdain by the culture as a whole, this was an extra insurance policy. With the military already conditioned to see themselves as supreme beings and their opponents as wild animals, a view which was then confirmed when Allied officers would order a surrender or a retreat when a battle was lost rather than squander the lives of their men, the Japanese soldier would question how anything other than a lowly beast could live with such shame, expect to be treated as a man or an equal, or even expect to be sufficiently fed and protected as was their right under the Geneva Convention of 1929, which Japan had signed but refused to ratify. To provide a cold hard statistic, the death rate for American POWs in German hands during World War II was 1.2%, and around 0.15% for Germans in the hands of the US. The death rate for American sailors, marines, GIs and airmen taken prison by Imperial Japan was around 33%. The Allies had a bad, but here's another statistic. In total, around 80,000 Allied POWs returned to their respective countries after the Japanese surrender. That's after five years of war. After eight years of war in China, a grand total of 56, not hundreds, not thousand, just 50 fucking six guys returned home. In fairness, they probably had their choice of poontang. Oh, maybe not. Fear of shame and dishonor fed the propensity of Japanese forces to perform group Banzai charges, the name derived from Tenoheka Banzai roughly meaning long live the emperor. Or even worse, individual feigned surrenders where the surrendering soldier, sometimes wounded, would pull a pistol or detonate a grenade among his captors. In the air, these became kamikaze or divine wind attacks where a pilot would plunge into the deck of an enemy ship or land fortification. These were portrayed as brave volunteers back home, 
But I have some anecdotal evidence from Japanese friends that later in the war, some were pacifists, democrats, or other heretics who were pressed into military service and induced with threats of what the omnipresent Kenpei Tai, Japanese Gestapo, could do to their parents and siblings back home. Even in the propaganda reels you see kids grinning maniacally, or smiling with terrified eyes as they drink their last toast, stroke a kitten for the last time, or chat with their friends for the last time. Not even shitty grainy black and white footage can contain the one emotion that permeates those reels. Dread. When deciding to cover the history, I endeavour to avoid mentioning dishonour where possible. As it implies, there is honour in obliterating oneself for a lost cause, torturing prisoners or raping and murdering civilians. In the very real sense, within the Imperial Japanese forces at the time, it appears that acting with dishonour means not being a complete cunt. However, it is important that I stress that there were some within the Japanese populace, and some although very rare within the Imperial Japanese military who disdained the deeds of their zealous colleagues. War can throw some unique people into the mix. For example, Chiyune Sugihara. He was the Japanese vice consul in Lithuania who saved thousands of Polish and Lithuanian citizens from extermination in 1940 by issuing them with transit visas for Japan. On his return to Japan in 1947, he was fired by the Japanese foreign ministry. His widow claims it was due to that incident. It would look great on a fucking resume though, fired for human decency and compassion. Ironically, the Japanese, for their own strange reasons, provided refuge for many Jews fleeing the Nazis. It's also worth remembering that a few years earlier and on the other side of the world, an ardent Nazi called John Rabe saved thousands of Chinese civilians from the marauding savagery of the Imperial Japanese forces during the rape of Nanjing. On Rabe's return to Germany and subsequent attempt to publicise the barbarity he witnessed, he was arrested and silenced by the Gestapo. After the war, he was declared a Nazi by the Allies and lived his short remaining days in poverty. The cynic within me suspects it was partially due to a misaligning of prejudices and sympathies, but Sugihara and Rabe have proved themselves worthy of being called men, as both selflessly risked personal safety and destroyed their future livelihoods for a noble cause. Additionally, both more than proved the old maxim, no good deed goes unpunished. So how the fuck does this all relate to the Marianas lobby, I hear you cry. Patience, dear imaginary viewer, I'm getting to it. In the run-up to World War I, with an eye on Germany's Asian possessions, Japan had joined the Entente powers against the Central powers. They had previously taken Korea, Taiwan and Port Arthur, now Lushunko in China, with designs on eating up more of China. On the outbreak of World War I, they quickly snatched up the Northern Marianas, and were granted possession at the end of World War I by the League of Nations. So in 15 years, the islanders had gone from Ola to Gutentag to Kanichi fucking Wa. It's also important to remember that for a considerable portion of the first half of the 20th century, the Western powers regarded the Japanese as not quite people. Ironically, the Western powers and Japan shared one belief more than any other. That was their own respective racial superiorities. The Japanese were acutely attuned to this second-class treatment by the West, which had gone on for about 50 years, and fed their collective inferiority complex. There's only one thing worse than a prick with an inferiority complex, that's a prick with an inferiority complex and a gun. This sense of racial superiority facilitated Japanese war crimes in China in the late 1930s. War crimes that would make the Nazis look like a bunch of effete sensitivity trainers. Reports of the many vile atrocities turned public opinion even further in the US. The final straw was the Japanese seizure of French East Asian possessions, which prompted the US to freeze Japanese finances and declare an oil and strategic materials embargo. Enraged by this, and no doubt remembering Commodore Perry's successful visit, the Japanese returned the favour on December 7, 1941, with a little visit of their own to Pearl Harbour. The following day, on December 8th, the Japanese attacked Guam from the air, which continued for much of the day. On the 9th, the same happened again. Then finally, on the early morning of the 10th, the Japanese invasion fleet landed. The US only had token forces on the island, who were ordered to surrender later that day. Six US Navy sailors correctly deduced that captivity under the Japanese was a shitty idea, so they went into hiding. Five were later betrayed by locals, captured over time and given a Tokyo crew cut. One guy called Tweed was hidden by natives and moved around to avoid capture. 
The Japanese abducted, tortured and murdered natives they suspected of hiding him. But many natives remained loyal and he survived the war with much assistance from a native called Antonio Arturo, which I think is Spanish for bollocks of steel. And when the Americans eventually returned, Tweed used a mirror to signal them with the locations of Japanese positions. During the occupation, the Japanese attempted a Japanization policy as they had decided, in an act of futility not again seen until the planning of the 1945 Hiroshima Autumn Festival, that they were going to hold the area after the successful conclusion of the war. Now, it's worth remembering that the Imperial Japanese Navy hated one group even more than the Americans, British, Russians, French and Chinese. That group was the fucking Imperial Japanese Army. Furthermore, the feelings were mutual. As a result, they had different approaches to pacification methods. The Imperial Japanese Army initially controlled the governance of the island, with the Navy taking control in 1942. There's no doubt they were all cunts, but because the Navy were more dedicated to Japanization, which had met some success in Korea and Taiwan, the carrot was used as much as the katana. The forced Japanization process began with the organization of social activities and the opening of schools. However, the Japanese drove what could prove to be a permanent wedge between the native Shamoro people of Guam and those of Saipan and Tinian. The Japanese used Japanized Shamoro from Saipan and Tinian during the invasion of Guam as spies to root out potential troublemakers, with all the nasty implications of being suspected of harboring enmity towards the Empire. The mask slipped in early 1944 with an American liberation on the horizon. The army once again took control and being vicious cunts saw no problem in press ganging all natives over 12 into either farm labour or the building of airstrips and defensive positions. The Japanese felt they could never fully trust the natives, particularly the ones on Guam. One wonders fucking why. They felt the natives were too Americanized to become fully Japanese. Many who were selected for work on defensive positions were brutalized during and bayoneted and beheaded after the completion of their forced assignments. Suddenly, in 1944, around 15,000 natives were forced marched to interior jungle concentration camps with fuck all food or shelter and sanitary conditions that would make a Somali public toilet look like the kitchen of a five star hotel. As events would play out, these were the lucky ones. It is estimated that as much as 10% of Guam's native population was murdered during the Japanese occupation. And this final cruel act carried two unintended benefits. It kept many natives clear of being caught in the middle of firefights and gave the Americans a free hand in kicking the fuck out of the Japanese. And out of the Japanese, the fuck the Americans proceeded to kick. As Guam was the last of the Marianas to be liberated, you can fly Thunderbolts who were stationed in Saipan in CAS roles along with F4U Corsairs when they arrive. And hopefully either Mag 3, Heat Blur or ED, or preferably all three, will make the Hellcat, the Zero, the Kawanishi N1K, the Nakajima B5N, and of course some Imperial Japanese Navy assets and some IJA war criminals to strafe with glee. The liberation of Guam began with heavy bombardment from the air and sea, followed by US forces landing and establishing beachheads on the Orote Peninsula on 21st of July 1944. By the 10th of August 1944, the Japanese forces had been crushed. The initial attack was quite successful, but as the Marines and soldiers moved further south, they faced increasingly desperate resistance, including Banzai charges and feigned surrenders. The US attacked with an overwhelming force of over 59,000. Roughly 1,800 GIs and Marines were killed. The Japanese began with a force of around 22,000. By the end, approximately 18,500 were dead. Before we move on, here's a couple of little stories that illustrate how much the Japanese system fucked its soldiers psychologically. There were several holdouts on the island with attacks on Marines up to 1945. Beyond 1945, a few groups of soldiers, whom either through indoctrination, disbelief of Japanese surrender, or having unfuckable spouses waiting for them back home, decided to remain in hiding on the island. Sergeant Masashi Ito surrendered in May 1960 after his friends were captured and he was convinced to surrender. 19 fucking 60, 15 fucking years after the war ended, think of the poontang that poor fucker missed out on. However, Sergeant Ito was a mere hobbyist in swearing off pussy in comparison to Sergeant Yoichi Yokoi, who lived in a cave until 19 fucking 70 fucking 2. He was only captured when some villagers mistaking him for a local approached. He attacked them, and they, having subsisted on a lot more than fucking woodlice and frogs for the last couple of decades, kicked the shit out of him and then passed him on to police. On his return to Japan, Sergeant Yokoi became a TV personality and advocate for austere living, 
For fuck's sake, cutting a few luxuries at times of necessity is one thing, but seeking advice from this guy is like asking Jeffrey Dahmer what to cook on a first date. For a little perspective here, Sergeant Yokoi's story is the equivalent of someone crawling down a manhole cover in 1993, then re-emerging today fretfully inquiring if Margaret Thatcher had become queen yet. I bet Bear Grylls was all over this guy for piss recipes. Our next beautiful tropical island is Rota. Like Tinian, Saipan and your great-grandmother, this was sold to the Germans at the turn of the 20th century and taken by the Japanese at the start of World War I. The Japanese didn't push much by way of development here, only setting up sugar plantations which ultimately proved unsuccessful. The island was garrisoned to about 2,800 troops. After taking Saipan, Tinian and Guam, the US occasionally bombed the island in an attempt to disable a radio transmitter in contact with the Japanese home islands. The US didn't need it, so they didn't bother taking it, instead leaving the Japanese garrison alone until an hour after Japan surrendered in 1945, when the garrison surrendered to the US Marines. I find the malevolent charm in leapfrogging some places effectively cutting them off from supplies. It could only have been topped if the Allies had set up leaflet drops sharing them with pictures of hamburgers. One funny facet of this story is that if US bombers developed any mechanical issues, they would dump their bombs on Rota before returning to land on Saipan or Guam. But compared to their comrades on the other islands, these guys had it lucky. You will see just how lucky later on. Aguiguan, or however the fuck it's pronounced, is a small island just to the south of Tinian. It is nicknamed Goat Island as a result of the famous internet artist Goatsy living there for a few years in the early 2000s. You'll find his artwork with a Google image search. It is completely uninhabited now, but during World War II hosted a small Japanese garrison, which had the distinction of being the only Japanese surrender held aboard a US Coast Guard vessel two days after Japan had surrendered. Again, the Japanese soldiers here were lucky as the island was not part of the US strategy. It's pretty much a bird reserve now, so watch your fucking engines. Tinian had lost almost all of its natives thanks to the aforementioned European diseases and land conflicts with the Spanish over the centuries. Many of those who survived were deported to Guam. So when the Germans took control, they left the island to the Spanish ranchers and in a very young German move did absolutely fuck all with the place. Not so when the Japanese took control, they settled the island with Japanese, Okinawans and Koreans. They built roads, power stations, port facilities. They built schools, planted sugar, coffee and cotton. No fucking around with those guys and by the time the Americans were coming, nearly 16,000 Japanese civilians were on the island. Tinian and its northern neighbour Saipan were a vital prize in the US Pacific strategy. When the Japanese realised this, they fortified the islands, bringing in around 8,000 military personnel, also increasing protection around the northern and western airfields, used by the Japanese as small fighter strips and for larger traffic respectively. With artillery support from the recently taken Saipan to the north, the Marines swarmed two beaches on the northwest of the island. Eventually over 40,000 Marines fought their way across the island. The battle lasted little more than a week, but the Japanese were tenacious in their defence, incurring over 5,500 dead and at least 2,000 unaccounted for, more than likely dead. That's compared to only 326 US Marines killed. On the civilian side, up to 4,000 Japanese civilians died, either killed in the crossfire or quite a few murdered by their own troops and many more committing suicide. Some small groups of Japanese forces took to the caves in the south of the island, launched some counterattacks and murdered more civilians, but their efforts were futile and brought to an end by August 3rd. The Japanese Imperial Army and Navy had deserved reputations for extreme brutality. However, their brutality varied. In China and the Philippines, they were absolute cunts. In Korea and Taiwan, there were phases of cuntiness, but overall they behaved with a veneer of colonial civility. Prior to the outbreak of war on Tinian and Saipan, they were generally fairly normal with the exception of the usual fuckery all colonial powers engaged in. Definitely shitty by modern standards, but at the time not much worse than any other colonial master. It wasn't until one of the papers I read on this location and period mentioned that many of the troops moved here in 1944 had been transferred from mainland China that the brutality towards the natives clicked into place. 
As soon as the US took control of the island, US naval combat engineers repaired the Japanese airfields and began construction of the world's largest World War II airfield on the northern end of the island, appropriately called Northfield. It covered the entire northern part of the island in runways and taxiways to host the B-29 Superfortress aircraft for the upcoming bombing raids on the Japanese home islands. In addition, atom bomb pits were built to load the larger bombs onto the Superfortress aircraft. In the very early morning of the 6th of August 1945, Theonola Gay, piloted by Colonel Paul Tibbets, took off and headed towards Iwo Jima. Above Iwo Jima, they set course for an industrial city in southeastern Honshu. At 8.16 a.m. at an altitude of 580 meters above Hiroshima, Little Boy detonated, forever changing the course of history. Three days later, just after a quarter to four in the morning on August 9th, the boxcar, another superfortress piloted by Major Charles Sweeney, took off from Northfield at Tinian. They proceeded to their rendezvous point just off the coast of Japan. The camera plane was not at the agreed rendezvous point and the boxcar circled for 40 minutes before proceeding to their primary target. What follows is what can only be described as unbelievable luck, on both ends of the scale. The boxcar arrived over the primary target, Kokura, an ancient city at the north of Kyushu. However, cloud, smoke and impending Japanese fighters prevented an attack. So it was decided to proceed to the secondary target, Nagasaki, an industrial city on the west coast of Kyushu. At 11.02 am, at an altitude of 503 meters, Fat Man detonated, and shit in Nagasaki went all Hiroshima. I can't help but dwell on the fact that a few clouds saved Kokura while dooming Nagasaki. Even more crazy is the fact that a handful of people from Nagasaki who found themselves in Hiroshima on the morning of the 6th rightly decided to fuck off home as shit was getting intense, sometimes only arriving home on the morning of the 9th. The equivalent of climbing out one's window to avoid Jehovah's Witnesses knocking at the door and running slap bang into a couple of Mormon missionaries. Only six days later, Emperor Hirohito broadcast the Japanese surrender, and on September the 2nd, it was signed. It's a controversial question I've returned to now and then over the years. Why did Harry Truman order such an attack? How could he? However, after much thought, I've arrived at the interpretation that if someone is to shoulder the historic burden for this, it's not President Truman. Neither is it Oppenheimer nor his team. After all, the bomb was developed to gain the technology before the Nazis, who would have had no compunction in using it indiscriminately. Additionally, the US lost a total of around 104,000 personnel during the liberation of Europe, including Germany. By contrast, they had lost roughly 111,000 troops in the Pacific, and they had yet to liberate the Japanese home islands. And yes, I use liberate deliberately. When a regime expends life so cheaply, its people require liberation. The blame lies with the man who signed off on the invasion of China, the use of poison gas on the attack on Pearl Harbor. The man who later berated his admirals and generals for losing battles and goaded them into futile engagements when the balance of war was already tipped against them. The man who, along with his uncles, themselves guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, knowing the war was lost and the people in the Ryukyu Islands were about to be pounded into oblivion by Uncle Sam like a runaway at a monster cock porn shoot, still held off on ordering a surrender until assurances were obtained that he would neither be charged with war crimes nor removed from his position. The man who was ultimately responsible for over 23 million civilian deaths alone. 18 million in China, 4 million in the Netherlands East Indies, 1 million in the Philippines, and around 400,000 in Japan, and another 4 million Chinese soldiers, 1.7 million Japanese soldiers, and 130,000 Allied soldiers. A man who never faced a court, retained a long life of luxury, became angry when questioned about complicity, and when asked about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, simply said, Shikata Ganai, it cannot be helped. I am, of course, speaking of the chrysanthemum cocksucker himself, Hirohito. Part of the airbase known as Westfield is now Tinian International Airport. Northfield was largely left to return to nature. However, recently a runway and some taxiways have been cleared and refurbished as part of an overall contingency plan in the event of another war with a different, albeit similarly totalitarian, adversary in the Pacific. The story of Saipan is very similar to that of Tinian. 
European diseases and Spanish ranchers killed most of the native Chamorros. There was immigration of Carolinians in the 19th century who went on to make up a minority in Saipan and Tinian. As previously established with the other islands, the Germans did absolutely bugger all here. But when the Japanese took over, they went about turning the local economy towards cash crops, they built roads, opened schools and generally sought to modernise the place. Now, although the natives were allowed education and encouraged towards Japanization, the system was designed to stop short of them becoming Japanese citizens, which Imperial Japan claimed would have broken the stewardship agreement. But let's face it, at this point taking the word of Imperial Japan at face value would be akin to asking Mel Gibson about the primary causes of World War II. In the 20s and 30s, some natives petitioned for Japanese citizenship. This was welcomed by some in Japan as a sign of the efficacy of Japanization. However, in truth, the natives were probably just sick to the fucking teeth of being the slackest bottom at the pride party. It is known that quite a few Japanese on the island saw it as a sign that the natives were getting uppity and that Japanization had gone too far. There were roughly three classes of people on the islands. First were the Japanese, second were the Okinawans, Koreans and Taiwanese, and third were the Shamoro and Carolinians. The Carolinians were really third and a half in Japanese eyes due to their darker appearance. The Shamoro and Carolinians were referred to as Tomen by the Japanese, this means people of the land. It was regarded as a slur by the natives and seemed to have been used in that way by the Japanese. I suppose similar to how I use hipster but probably used with less hatred. Additionally, it seems that many of the Japanese civilians on Saipan were kind of dodging the draft on the mainland, and were overall more lax in their efforts at building defences. When the battle-hardened, war-crime-prone and rapey veterans arrived from China in early 1944, all of that changed. The natives were enslaved and brutalised at every opportunity. Japanese civilians, who should have been previously evacuated, were either pressed into militia-like defence associations or other vital work. This had an effect of creating some of the most memorable images from the Battle of Saipan. Saipan was the D-Day of the Pacific. In fact, the bombardment of Saipan began one week after D-Day on Tuesday, June 13, 1944. The US first struck from the air, damaging or destroying all but 50 of the 400 or so Japanese aircraft protecting the islands. On the 16th of June in the Philippine Sea, under the command of Admiral Jizaburo Ozawa, the Japanese carriers, instead of scrambling all available aircraft, sent out waves of 60 or 70 at a time. The US sent around 140 aircraft to meet them. The Japanese pilots, through previous attrition, were by and large complete novices, and by this stage Japanese training had been reduced significantly. The US pilots were highly trained and experienced. Any Japanese lucky enough to get past the US fighters were quickly swatted by US naval defences, with only one Japanese aircraft managing to drop its bomb causing minor damage. Two US naval pilots, David McCampbell and Alex Breku, flying Grumman F6F Hellcats became aces within half an hour of taking off. Throughout the day the US pilots recovered, refueled and rearmed, taking off again as the Japanese launched wave after wave. Each wave was in turn destroyed until at the end of the first day, 358 Japanese losses were counted, with the Americans losing 33. The Japanese squadrons were being penetrated so thoroughly and frequently that they were expecting a marriage proposal during the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which became known as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. On the ground, the first task was the naval bombardment, taking out the Japanese seaplane base at Tanapag Harbour, followed by minesweepers clearing lanes for the marine landing craft. The marines had a tough task, unlike their previous Pacific encounters. There was the usual jungle fighting, low-lying mountains running down the centre of Saipan, and they had their first taste in the Pacific of fighting through larger towns and villages. On the 15th of June, two marine divisions landed here to the south near the village of Chalan Piao and further north here near the settlement of San Jose. Getting 20,000 marines ashore on the first day, they quickly established a one-kilometre beachhead. The army landed on the 16th of June and advanced on the Japanese airfield at Azlito, now Saipan International Airport. The US forces then pushed north, with the marines along each coast and the army taking the tougher central ridge terrain. This caused a pocket in the US lines and created tension between the army and marines. On the 7th of July, another Banzai charge was arranged, with the able-bodied and armed men at the front, followed by the wounded, some bleeding and on crutches and barely armed, for fuck's sake. The predictable result of this was at least 3,000 Japanese dead, and 400 US dead. Anyone who has ever played an FPS knows that that was a fucking pretty impressive PvP-KD ratio for the Americans. 
The Japanese were forced into more and more isolated positions in the northern highlands of the island. At this point, the Japanese commanders, including an admiral, started offing themselves like messianic cult leaders. Now we get to one of the sickest elements, and the reason I went so deeply into the forces at play on the imperial psyche. The military authorities had convinced the Japanese civilians on Saipan, those civilians they had failed to evacuate and protect, that the Americans would do to them what their troops had done in Nanjing. Of course the civilians didn't know what was done in Nanjing, but let's just say that when the Japanese propaganda was being written, the writers didn't have to use their imagination. It's also worth pointing out that a few war crimes such as rape and murder would likely have been committed by individuals and small groups of US forces. Evidence from France, Germany and later evidence from Okinawa and Japan bear that out. Often neither properly investigated nor prosecuted, the evidence demonstrates that while it was by no means as isolated as it should have been, neither was it encouraged and it was not so widespread as to become anywhere near ubiquitous or a foregone conclusion of US capture. In other words, Nanjing-like scenes would not have manifested here. In fact, the American forces had made extensive plans to prevent this and assist the civilian population. It's fair to say they went above and beyond in their attempts to save civilian lives, although mostly these attempts were fruitless. Japanese parents killed their children first, then themselves. Many jumping here from Suicide Cliff, there are famous newsreels of American soldiers trying to dissuade civilians from jumping as they poured over the edge like albatross chicks leaving the nest. Further north here, many jumped onto the rocks below. Some were rescued by the US Navy. It's also important to note that not all of the Japanese misgivings regarding the treatment of their military personnel were without foundation. There was the strong undercurrent I alluded to earlier. The Allies saw the Japanese as not quite human and vice versa. Wartime propaganda amplified this on both sides, and as a result of this and Japanese barbarity towards POWs and civilians, there was an extreme reluctance among all Allied troops to take Japanese POWs. It was simply more convenient to shoot them. Japanese fake surrenders and banzai charges reinforced this view. Additionally, it was common to collect Japanese body parts such as skulls. Senior officers were appalled by this and issued several warnings to their troops. But this was the most vicious and bloody theatre in World War II. On the other side of the world in 1940, Irvin Rommel was said to have coined the phrase, War without hate. But the Pacific theatre was definitely a most hateful war. There is one more little island that I discovered quite by accident. The only reason I flew all the way out here was I was expecting to find grass-skirted, cock-starved, beautiful native ladies doing the Lao Bi dance. You know, that dance they do when they're beseeching their gods to deliver a well-endowed man from the sky who'll alleviate all their sexual tension. To my extreme disappointment, all I found was some shipping containers arranged in X's. Because apparently the US used this island as a bombing range. That was until they signed the truce with the seagulls a couple of decades ago. A few years ago I would have said the only potential military operations on these islands would have been putting down a revolution of sweatshop workers or underage prostitutes, as the major issues facing these islands had to do with the importation of workers from the third world, sweatshops and sex trafficking. Individual congressmen from both sides of the house fought for and against the vested interests on these islands. The vested interests who wanted to prevent the application of US federal law concerning immigration, child protection and the minimum wage. Cross-party alliances were formed on both sides of this issue, demonstrating that simple political dichotomies are often false. The only current possible military escalation now is a confrontation with a relatively new dictatorship. One which also sees itself as a master race and definitely sees itself as master of Asia. Incidentally, it also imposes Confucian moralistic teachings and seems to think that if a sailor from the 15th century Ming treasure fleet so much as ejaculated or urinated in the sea, that constitutes an international legally binding establishment of territorial waters. It's unlikely, but a disaffected public could require a new patriotic distraction from a tanking economy. Hello Marianas, goodbye FPS, or so the current joke goes. My FPS has taken a hit on the Marianas with mid-40s in certain parts when low. 
although generally I'm getting somewhere from the mid to high 40s, 50s and even 60s at times. I must point out that due to a computational calamity and the complete fucking unavailability of new parts, I'm using the same old shit I was using last year, except most of it is new shit. I thought Covid wasn't supposed to affect children too much, so why aren't the little fuckers back in the factories hammering out graphics cards like they're supposed to be? Liking things that are pretty and shiny, I am running on fairly high graphics settings. Something the flight sim community are very used to is the arms race between hardware and software, and at the moment this map is the front. Like Syria, I expect over the next couple of months there will be some optimization that will make it far more efficient. There will be some bugs too, but that's all part of the fun. Notwithstanding the above, it's a gorgeous map and the detail is absolutely astounding. It could be my bias, but I love tropical islands. I wasn't built to live in eternal winter. I like the mixture of jungle, beach and sun. I like grass skirts and free tittied ladies. I like the danger of knowing your head could end up on your mother-in-law's fireplace if you don't keep daughter happy in bed. I less like the fact that your cock could end up on the barbecue. I hope I'm pissing up the right tree here, but this map is the perfect bit of foreplay on ED's part for World War II and the Pacific. No one's doing it, and I believe the Pacific and World War II could be a very successful venture for both ED and third party developers. I suspect there are many who would love a complete Pacific plane set, or as complete as documentation and existing specimens allow. This makes a lot more sense for the Marianas map, barring of course the outlier scenario I previously mentioned. I heard some discussion way back that future plans involve being able to graphically wind back the clock to World War II, which would be wonderful, because there are a fucking unfathomable quantity of golf courses here. I have to admit to not being a fan of golf. Mark Twain said golf is a good walk spoiled. Winston Churchill said playing golf is like chasing a quinine pill around a cow pasture. And Robin Williams said golf was one of the few sports where a white man can dress as a black pimp. And I wholeheartedly agree with all three. Personally, I see golf as a game played by those whom no longer have access to pussy. It's a game for middle-aged men lacking the motivation to become incels. I'd rather walk across a forest or jungle than a golf course. Quite frankly, I think a fucking minefield would be better use of the land. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm cool with those funny little American rules cricket fields I see here and there. If it gives the good ladies of the afternoon in the Marianas a well-earned rest, I'm all for it. It was due to its World War II significance that I delved into the background of the main driver of the history here. As always, I tried to stay out of politics, but I believe history and politics should be non-overlapping magisteria. No one should blame anyone alive today for something that transpired 80 years ago, but I know there are some in every country that hold sacred, long discredited, rancid philosophies. I generally try to have fun with the topics I cover, but it's quite difficult to cram in copious dick jokes when discussing war crimes, even little ones. In fact, it's difficult to find any mirth in war crimes, unless you're actually there, perpetrating them. Returning to my question, who gives away free things? Apparently when I said lonely fucking weirdos, I may have been wrong. It's happened once before, but I was only partially wrong. Sometimes quite the opposite is true. As in this case, when a group of people have actually gone above and beyond to provide a gift to lonely fucking weirdos. Yes, you fuckers. As always, oh wait a second. If you're thinking of buying a button box, this may be a good time, as Moises and Ruben from Blackhog are giving 10% off until the 31st of August if you use my promotional code, LAOB2021. This applies to all button boxes, and no, this is not a paid promotion as I'm not skimming a cut. If you want to see my review on the Blackhog, just click on the card that appears on the video now. So, all that's left to say is, thank you very much for watching, please don't forget to dislike or tell me to go fuck myself below.